In life, there are limits. But for people who take pleasure in pushing the limits, the weather should never be one. At Windrider, they make lightweight and breathable outdoor shirts with UPF 50 plus sun protection. Stay cool and comfortable in the hottest conditions with Windrider. Right now, buy two Helios long sleeve sun shirts and get 25% off, backed by a 30 day money back guarantee. Shop online at windrider.com slash outdoors. That's windrider.com slash outdoors. Leftovers. Or the DMV. Number 97. Or house cleaning. Or Chumba Casino always brings the fun. Play over a hundred different games online for free from anywhere. You could redeem some serious prizes. Chumba. ChumbaCasino.com. Live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, everybody. I'm Coach Bill Courtney from the Oscar winning documentary, Undefeated. I believe that our country's problems can never be solved by a bunch of fancy people in nice suits talking big words that nobody ever uses on CNN and Fox, but rather by an army of normal folks, us, just you and me saying, hey man, I, I can help. Our podcast, An Army of Normal Folks, is building up this army that I think can change this country, and I hope you'll join us wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, my lovely human beings. I'm Ray Harkins. You're listening to 100 Words or Less, the podcast, which I actually just got another question for recently because, you know, people are like, hey, why'd you name the show that way? It was a joke. It was a joke originally because, uh, you know, back in the Civil War era, oh, I'm just joking about that, but back in school, like maybe, you know, when I was in elementary school, you would get an assignment to say, and 100 words or less summarize this particular thing. So it would be all about, you know, your strength in editing and being very concise. And uh, I was never good at that. And so I thought it was funny to name it this. And anyways, so here we are with the show, 100 words or less. <laughs> so people that appear on the show occasionally are like, hey, is this going to be a really short podcast? And I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's not that. So Anyways, just to, you know, clear up the uh, notions of why this is named this. It has nothing to do with music, the actual title of the show, but the show itself has everything to do with music of the DIY variety, whether it's punk, metal, hardcore, indie rock, whatever you want to call it, as long as it exists in that, uh, you know, ecosystem of sort of weirdos and outside the mainstream world, that's what we travel in. And uh, I hope you're doing okay. I'll ask you a little, a few more follow-up questions on that in a moment. But we have Justine Jones from Employed to Serve and an awesome record label over in the UK called Holy Roar Records. Uh, I've been a fan of her band and what she's been doing for quite some time. I got keyed into Employed to Serve, I want to say, via my close friend Mike Minnick, the vocalist of Curl Up and Die. Uh, or someone else. I can't remember. It's, it, it, you know, these things blend together when you're old. But I uh, love the band. And uh, yeah, Justine reached out to me on Instagram and was like, hey, fan of your show. And I'm like, well, funny enough, I'm a fan of you. Let's have you on the show. So we did. We actually recorded, I want to say, a couple of weeks ago. So it was definitely in the pandemic era. But uh, we don't address that because, uh, you know, when we're doing these discussions, I don't really want to uh, harp on that and because, you know, these conversations are meant to be evergreen in many respects. So, But anyways, uh, yeah, that's who we got this week. And uh, you, you, the listener, you can email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com always. And if you'd like to support the show, you can always leave a rating and review on any of your favorite podcast catchers, whether that's Overcast, Apple Podcast, you can't leave a review on Spotify, but um, you know Stitcher, you can leave reviews and star ratings. So that is free. It will take you zero, like, well, I would say zero time. It'll take you less than a minute to do that, and it helps out the show tremendously. But the best thing you can do is spread the word via social media, whether that's tagging your guests or the guest on this show, whether it's just letting friends know. That is how this show grows. Frankly, that's like the best way, you know, when you ask your friend, like, hey, what podcast are you listening to? You can mention this along the, you know, myriad of others that you listen to. So I would appreciate that immensely. And uh, yeah, because, you know, I'm just, I want to make sure that this, this show gets in the right ears of the right people. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, uh, yeah, how are you? I'm existing <laughs> through this, this weirdness that obviously we're all existing in. And someone said, I think it's like either six or seven weeks that we've been doing this. And um 
yeah, it feels like it's been forever, but then it also feels like it's just started. And I don't know, time collapses in and on itself. And, uh, you know, I hope that you're getting some peace of mind in certain areas, whether that's, uh, you know, movies, music, whatever it is that gives you that joy, hold on to it and keep holding on to it. So please do that. And, uh, yeah, let's just dive in with Justine. She was a great chat. Uh, it was one nice, nice Sunday morning or Saturday morning. I can't remember exactly, but, uh, it was a great chat. So here's Justine right now. fairly certain that uh, my friend Mike showed me you guys, uh, Mike from Curl Up and Die, <laughs> who was like, hey, oh, this, yeah. yeah, he was like, hey, this band is really good. You would like them. And uh, I think it was yeah, the warmth of a dying sun. And it, I always love getting exposed to bands that just like, you know, knock my socks back where I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like, where, how have I not heard of this band before? Like, it seems so fully formed and like ready to take over and it always seems like there's bands from the UK in particular that, that do that. Like, I mean, you know, you guys like, you know, frontiers, like just these bands that I don't know, they come out of nowhere for me personally being, you know, from the United States. And I I just always seem to find (laughs) bands from the UK that kind of do that. And even though the U S pays attention to bands from the UK, I still think there's this really, really weird divide where people, don't pay as close of attention as they should from stuff that's coming out from the UK. I don't know if you, I'm sure you have feelings on that, but I don't know if you've noticed that or if that's something that just, you know, you don't even think about. Um, I guess it's hard because I'm obviously like uh, America is so huge that I think it's probably quite hard to sort of like tune into like bands anyway. So like on top of the fact that like we're overseas, um, and like a small country, I, I guess it kind of is kind of hard to sort of like fight through the noise of other bands. Um, but in terms of like uh, UK bands, like sounding fully formed, I guess it's just because um, it takes a while for sort of like US press and and like uh, Spotify playlists and like Apple Music playlists to pick up on UK bands. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it's to say like I worked for years at Century Media and it was one of those things like signing architects and like trying to get them exposed to the States was like the most difficult task possible. <laughs> like it was for, yeah. for years of just being like, listen, this band is really good. You need to listen to hollow crown and people just being like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's like, no, but sh- trust me, this is good. And it just, it took forever. But then it finally, you know, it happens um, through a hard work and perseverance, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's weird because it just seems like, yeah, to your point, America is huge, but you know, there is so much interesting and good stuff that comes out from other places that, um, yeah, I guess you just have to work that much harder to <laughs> make people pay attention, I guess. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, Architects is such a sick band for sure. Like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just really interesting sort of like hearing it from your perspective. Cause obviously I only know it from mine and, um, with the UK, we're very, very much keyed into like what America's doing. Um, I think like, uh, there's loads of like things right out right now that's really good for like uh staying like keyed in like i find like Bandcamp really useful um and same with like spotify playlists i actually think like their algorithms are um like improved massively and like every friday i can go on like the new release radar and like all the new stuff like keyed into my like interest is just like already there um but that's the kind of thing i guess like with my job um and i sort of like uh i guess right for kerrang uh, it's kind of my job to sort of stay keyed in so I guess like it's kind of hard to sort of separate myself from that. Yeah. No, it is true. And I, I think that, you know, when it is your, uh, you know, quote unquote job to pay attention, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, even though if you may move away from that in some capacity, you know, whatever, you're, you know, not playing in a band anymore or, you know, you're not doing things that are like directly connected to it it does take, you know, more work to pay attention to it. And I use the word work in air quotes because, you know, <laughs> working to keep up with new music is not work, but. <laughs> oh, it's like a chore, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, to, but yeah, to your point, I mean, it, it is interesting the, um, the, the, the way that music is delivered to people because, you know, you can listen to stuff and be really into it. But, you know, if you don't, I guess, I guess if you're not taking like a deeper dive, you'd be like, oh yeah, the, you know, employed to serve is, or, is great. 
but they like no one would maybe even look at where you were from, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I suppose like uh, to sort of like kind of delve in deeper there, it's like I find uh, bands, especially in sort of like hardcore scenes and adjacent scenes, I think they're really good at yelling about their friends' bands are really good. Like, uh, say, for example, us, we always kind of like champion like Venom Prison or Conjurer and bands like that. And I think it's the same for stateside bands. So I suppose like once you kind of like get into one of those bands, you kind of almost scratch the surface. And then kind of, and if you're like a nerdy person like I am, you can kind of deep dive in it all. No, that's true. I, I didn't think about because, you know, a lot of people that are whatever, I'm almost 40 years old. So they're, you know, I'm ancient by all stretches of the hardcore imagination. But, you know, a, a lot of people complain about the loss of sort of regionality with bands, you know, where it's like, oh, yeah, especially in the States, you know, people could live in, you know, five different parts of the country and, you know, fly into like practice. I mean, of course, that's like, you know, uh, at a much later stage in the band's life or whatever. But to your point, there is that regionality that happens just by, you know, oh, yeah, like there's these bands that live two hours around us. And then we start to shout each other out and wear each other's shirts and stuff like that. So that does, you know, lead one person to another band or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As opposed to, um, yeah, you, you just, you know, identify with a particular like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, really into the Washington, D.C. hardcore scene or whatever. It's like that that can happen through different ways rather than just like knowing where all the bands are from at all times. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so kind of putting the, the, the focus squarely on you, um, you know, born and raised, I presume in the UK and what, what town in particular? Uh, so I live in a small town called Woking just outside London. Um, we are famous for HG Wells, uh, who wrote war of the worlds. Yes. Um, yeah. What else have we got near us? Uh, Paul Weller is from here. Nice. Um, and down the road in Alton is, I think Jane Austen. Okay. I might be wrong. Yeah. But yeah, we've got we've got we've got rolling hills, um, and a lot of trees. Uh, so a lot of bands come out of here because there's not too much going on. Right. And I think it's so interesting for people that have never, um, you know, traveled to uh, that part of the world that it's so, you know, I mean, so many people just automatically think of, you know, London and the bustling metropolis. And then, you know, you drive like whatever, literally a half an hour outside the city. And then you're in like, you know, the pastoral countryside and stuff like that. And to have bands come from, you know, rural areas, like, yes, of course it happens in America, but it happens more often than not (laughs) in the UK. It happens (laughs) all the time, you know? And so do you think that is just because of the I guess the, the maybe, you know, boredom and lack of things to do. Oh yeah, for sure. And like the, the wonderful thing about England is that, uh, it's like you said, like you drive an hour in any direction and you, you'll get something different. Like I can drive an hour and I'll be by the seaside in Brighton. Um, you know, I can go to the mountains in Scotland within six hours. Um, so it's very different from the, uh, from the U S I think in that respect. Um, but yeah, like it's, I think there is like a lot of sort of boredom and, especially in like um, our sort of provincial towns like Woking, you just a lot of uh, a lot of teenagers kind of hit 14, get bored and start drinking in the local park. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's other things to do with Netflix and that now. But when I when I was 14, that is what we did. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, it is. And uh, because the um, culture of that particular area of the world too, you know, drinking is, I mean, drinking is pervasive in America too, but you know, it just has seemed to always be, um, you know, a part of that country in general. So it makes sense that it's like, oh yeah, the moment that I could even try to find alcohol, like I will just cause I'm bored. Oh yeah, for sure. Like it's, it's so ridiculous. Like you, you spend, you spend most of uh, the week trying to like steal drinks from your parents and then you have like one can and, and one cigarette between like six of you. And you always sit in the circle <laughs> taking sips and puffs and go, oh, this is gross. I mean, this is great. Yeah, give me another. And like you, you spend about three years hating alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that idea of, you know, yeah, it's just like a group of friends and people are, you know, siphoning things off from their parents and then just, you know, hating whatever it is that they're consuming. But they're like, no, but this is cool, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. So like I had um, I had a friend who stole uh, it was either wine or vodka from his mum, and he thought that if he drank it and then returned it but filled it up with water 
and put it back in the drinks cabinet, his mum wouldn't notice. Um, <laughs> I his, love that. His 14 year old brain is like, yeah, this will work. Yeah, totally. <laughs> this is, that's what I like to call kid logic. It's beautiful. <laughs> You're like, it looks the same as vodka, so it's fine. <laughs> and so you, uh, what was your family structure like, you know, brothers and sisters, mom and dad in the house? How did that look? Yeah. So I have a younger brother who's actually just got into hardcore and stuff, um, which is really sick because I go to shows with him, which is nice. He actually goes to shows that I didn't even hear about. So that's cool. Uh, he's like my sort of, uh, finger on the pulse for that. Nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. My, my, my mom and dad are divorced. Um, classic uh yeah they've, they've so they've been around my whole life though how uh how old were you when they separated um oh how old was i i think they, they they've been on and off and since i was about six years old but i think they got like officially divorced when i was i want to say 15 oh okay so but were they were they both in the same house as you were kind of growing up or were you having to do like you know separate visitations or whatever uh, kind of. So like, um, my dad did a couple of, um, I guess tours in Afghanistan when he, cause he's a, he was a police officer for London. Um, and he, he would go out to, um, train Afghan police. Um, and so yeah, he did that. Like, so he was away quite a lot and then he'd do night shifts. So it was kind of this weird shift system. Um, and yeah, and I, I'd, I'd live with like, I live with my grandparents for a little bit and yeah, like it's, it's nothing like, you know, I got on with them really well and it's just sort of like classic sort of, uh, two thousands and tens kind of families really. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, d- divorce, whatever, you know, I think the divorce rate across the entire world is 50%. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or maybe that's just in America, but yeah. Uh, yeah, well, sure. like I always found it funny when like, well, not funny, but like weird when, um, I had my friends where they had both their parents together. I was like, wow, that's so rare. Right. It was almost sort of like a shiny card. <laughs> I, I know it's true. And I mean, I, you know, I, I have many conversations with people, you know, about their family backgrounds and like, it, it is so interesting to when people are just like, oh yeah, my parents have been together for like 30 years. And it's just like, oh, oh wow. Okay. That's not, I come from divorce and like many of my f- friends come from divorce and it's just like, oh yeah, that's uh there are people that do kind of get through that, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, stay you're together. A bit like, Man, where'd you get your lyrical inspiration from if your parents aren't divorced? <laughs> totally, <laughs> where'd totally. your angst from? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. T- talking about your experience of, you know, liking your mom and hating your dad or vice versa or whatever. <laughs> yeah you can't we can't i suppose you could be in a pma hardcore band um true true, that's, true. That's, that's, but that's maybe they they are full of uh together parents <laughs> yeah that's true that's a study i know that, that that would be a very interesting sociological study of just being like okay how sonically speaking if you were to go through divorce what would you sound like versus <laughs> yeah. parents that stay together this show is sponsored by better help how much time in any given week do you spend thinking about yourself or taking care of yourself If you actually stopped for a moment, you'd probably realize that it is pretty, pretty small. And it's so easy to get caught up in helping friends, family, coworkers, but then you end up feeling burnt out, stretched too thin, and that is where therapy comes into play. I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I've done it myself, done it with my wife, and I think these things are incredible tools for you to get unstuck from whatever it is that you are feeling stuck with. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's all online. It is designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Trust me in saying that therapy will help you through some of the most difficult parts of your life. I know that for a fact. So find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Ray to get 10% off your first month. Hey, that promo code's my name. That's great. That's betterhelp.com slash Ray. Give therapy a try and get unstuck. Experience the meteoric rise and enduring legacy of legendary musician Little Richard, the king and queen of rock and roll, in a new documentary from PBS American Masters. See how a prodigy with deep gospel roots became a gender-bending, genre-defining icon who fought for the rights of black artists. With exclusive rare audio from Little Richard and interviews with Big Frida, Keith Richards, Ringo Starr, and more. Stream Little Richard, King and Queen of Rock and Roll on PBS.org and the PBS 
Podcast app. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Rockabilia.com is the place where you need to buy all of your band merch in this quarantine and frankly out of quarantine. Use this code PC100Words. It gets you 15% off your order. The company is incredible. They've been you know, operating at full strength during this whole crisis, shipping out merch to you, shipping out puzzles. I ordered a puzzle from them recently, and I was so happy to receive it because you can't get puzzles anywhere right now. I don't know if you knew that, but they also have tons of stuff to outfit yourself for for this impending summer. You know, you got to get your, your short sleeve shirt game on point. You got to find your favorite band's merch, and it's all officially licensed. The bands get paid. You're supporting an independent business. There's so many positive things that you get from this transaction better than, you know, these horrible bootlegs that you see on Amazon, or if you're just simply Google, you know, insert band name here, band merch, you're going to get horrible results. Rockabilia.com, PC 100 words gets you 15% off your order, order it up right now and be thankful that you can order this band merch and get a discount on it. Okay. So support the scene, support the bands and support independent business. Thank you, Rockabilia. That sounds like a heavy job that your, your dad had from that perspective. Cause that's not uh, yeah. Going to train the Afghan police. That's like a, that's a, that's a pretty uh, intense experience. I'm sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Like it's so funny. Cause when I was like growing up, I was like, dad, why are you so like, I don't know, like miserable. And I kind of like, as I've grown up, I've kind of sympathized with him way more. Cause like I get really moody, like traveling into central London because like the commute about is just, just like, I'm, I'm sure it's like that everywhere in the world where everyone's just like miserable. But with his job, like for, so he was London police. So he would deal with like the worst people every single night. And then like he would, I think he was in the army before that. So he's just kind of chosen these jobs that are just like, oh, what, what, what can I get paid for? And what can I see the worst things all the time? Um, but yeah, like when he was doing the Afghan police um, uh, training, he, they, they had like a camp. Um, and they had like a shared sort of like hot water sort of urn kind of thing. Um, and underneath that was this giant cobra. And um, and everyone was just like, oh, yeah, like, don't mind him. Just just don't upset him. So they would just be getting his like tea and coffee from the camp. And there would just be this cobra underneath that he would hope just wouldn't bite him. <laughs> just, yeah, like. Uh, Casual. Right. And like what what is theoretically supposed to be probably the most relaxing part of his day getting a cup of tea. You have to still worry about a cobra. Yeah. And it's like, oh, of course, like the scorpions, like in the boots and and stuff. like. And these things can kill you. Right. So, like, you know, if you have like one bite and you don't notice it, it's almost too late. Um, so, yeah, he was just sort of like, to- like, so like blase about it. Just like, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we had this cobra and then we had some some spiders, like a spider nest that was poisonous. And I'm just like, oh, God, I love England. There's, there's literally nothing that can kill you here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, the the most th- the thing you have to be the most fearful of is you know g- if you're a pedestrian in London getting hit by a car or something. But you know that's yeah. like every major metropolitan area. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, I, I what what sort of kid were you as you were growing up? Like, you know, did you I guess immediately get attracted attracted to you know kind of the the weirdo side of things? Like, you know, participate or participating in the you know artistic route? Were you a sports kid? Where did you find yourself? I was a, a weird hybrid between the two. So I was sports heavy up until when I got into Slipknot, and then I went to proper metal. Right. So like. I, <laughs> Like like uh, football, so soccer, I guess for you guys is my um is like my number one sport, and I like pay I played to like, ju- I think just below county level, um I would like and then I sort of hit secondary school, um or high school for you guys, and like I kind of uh, you, you know when like you're really good and you're like you, uh like middle school kind of thing and you're like the best on the team and then you go to secondary school and all these other really good people come in and all of a sudden you're not very good um I just didn't have like (laughs) this sort of love for it to get better and I'm I think like around about the same time I sort of got into 
uh, playing guitar and bands and uh, I started listening to Nirvana, Nine Inch Nails, Slipknot, Korn, just basically like everything on Kerrang! and Scuzz TV. Uh, so it's sort of like a very um, sort of slow uh, progression. And of course, like my football practices stopped being after school and started being uh, at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. And like being a teenager and getting up that early was just it was just rough. So I just kind of ended up giving that up. Um, but yeah, and then that's uh, that's when the rift took over. Right. <laughs> I, do, I do like that uh, notion of, you know, when you are playing sports and, you know, your world is, uh, you know, what kind of is right in front of you, a.k.a., you know, people who are just, you know, playing it because whatever their parents forced them to. And you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good. And then the moment that you like, you know, play a tournament from other areas of the country or whatever, and you're just like, oh, there's a lot of people who are really good at this thing and like better than me. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And you just sort of like, um, like, and on Friday nights, you like, we had, um, so like, uh, weirdly Woking is a very Christian town. Um, and we have like a Christ, uh, the Christ church who used to put on shows. Um, and then we have like the YMCA sort of youth center, which is called the Y pod. Um, and they used to always put on like little local shows, like for screamo bands, um, and sort of like hardcore bands. Like, and like, I think back when I was a kid, uh, death call was a real big thing. Um, so yeah, like I just used to go there on Friday nights and then, yeah, I was too hungover from underage drinking to go to football practice. Sure. Right. You're <laughs> Tragic. Like, you go, right. You go to, go to a show on Friday night and you're just like, oh yeah, I don't, why, why am I going to go to soccer practice on, on. It's like, Saturday? why am I going to throw up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just, I, I, I just watched them you know, 17 year old children, uh, you know, do this weird hybrid of hardcore and, uh, and metal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, I guess, were you raised with any sort of, uh, religious strain being that you were from a town that was, uh, you know, uh, ha- had a heavy weight of Christianity around? Uh, no, not really. I think, um, my, my nan, my nan likes to go to church on like, christmas eve and that's about it like my family are very um loose sort of like with religion i think they would identify as christian um but they're not practicing do you know what i mean like it wasn't ever sort of like um implemented into my childhood they're more into sort of like spiritual stuff i think like they love uh things like i don't know do you like know most haunted no it was like Derek Akora, it's like he was like this psychic medium and stuff. They like love they love uh, tarot cards and oh sure. And things like that. Yeah. It's funny because very um, my family are very like uh, con- like kind of conservative looking and stuff. But if you ask them about things like that, they get really interested. So that's quite fun. Sure, sure, yeah, like the metaphysical sort of you know quote unquote new age beliefs of being in touch with your spirituality, knowing that there's probably something larger out there, but they, you know, don't necessarily, uh, adhere to the conventions of, you know, whatever Christianity or Catholicism or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Like, and my mum's like big into that stuff. Like she's had like psychic readings and I think she's had one for me done before. And yeah, it's it's quite, it's quite nice having, um, open man, uh, open-minded family members. So when I told them I was going to be in a band, I shout at people, they weren't too, uh, they weren't too shocked. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Right. They're like, oh, yeah, well, Justine is uh, exploring this side of her creative pursuits. <laughs> yeah. Right. She's bent in her own way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you were in uh, middle school and, and secondary, were you, um, you know, like outgoing? Did you find yourself, you know, being more introverted? I mean, you strike me just from, you know, an outside obs- observation that, you know, you are, um, I guess, comfortable in your own skin. Um, maybe obviously now, maybe not so much back then, but, um, you know, what kind of person were you? Um, so when I was like young, I, I was uh, very hyperactive, um, uh, outgoing and just like full of energy. Um, and then when I hit secondary school, I got bullied a bit. Uh, so that, so that kind of like made my confidence, uh, plummet a bit. But then after I finished, um, secondary school I went to like college and university and I sort of uh became loud again (laughs) right right so you uh you always had that in there it was just a matter of uh trying to find uh how to express that yeah for sure like I used to like it was a weird mix of like I used to get bullied but I'd always get invited to the older kids house parties so like I don't know I had this weird kind of uh uh, I was on the fringe I guess of being very uncool and cool maybe in the middle (laughs) <laughs> or or maybe it was because uh 
people were uh, comfortable with you being, um, you know, like, like, oh, yeah, we can throw Justine into, you know, a bunch of different situations. And we know that, you know, she'll like she'll probably be fun to be around in some capacity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because some people, <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, uh, the reason I say that is because, you know, l- like you said, you're this sort of, you know, hybrid person being, you know, interested in sports and also interested in, you know, weirdo music and stuff like that. And I, I think people that, you know, just stick to one thing and are like either a sports person or, you know, whatever, a music person. Of course, this is a gross overgeneralization, but, um, you know, you don't, you don't get that experience of kind of like, okay, well, I have to interact with these people. Um, and so, you know, I, I not assimilate per se, but like, you know, you know how to get along with them and not be like, you know, I'm not going to talk to my friend who's not into metal about, you know, how sick the new Slipknot record is or whatever. Like they're not, they just don't, they don't care, you know, so I'll have to find another way to relate to them. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's totally right on actually. Um, I think like for me, I just, I like people who are intensely into stuff so like my uh, my quote unquote day ones like so like people I've known since I was like five they're all in like medicine like one of them's a doctor one of them works in like a lab and stuff but I still kind of like get on really well with them despite the fact we have like completely different worlds um, but I think the the thing that we have in common is like uh, I guess passion for things um, so yeah like it is quite. Um, I, I just really enjoy talking to anyone about anything they're into, even if it's like trains or birds. Like I, I like the idea of bird watching actually. Maybe I should get into that one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are they, is it or, ornithology? Isn't that the study of birds? I think, I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a very important point. Cause I think that especially, you know, as you're growing up when you are, you know, just sampling a bunch of things to get into, um, I, I think people, you know, you do find the, those really strong friendships by the passion that you exude for whatever it is, you know, and obviously it's usually, you know, music or bands or, you know, sports or what have you. And you're just like, oh, you like this thing as much as I do. Like, let's hopefully our energy bounces off each other and we, you know, learn stuff and we just be excited about the thing. Yeah, for sure. And like, I don't know if you get this as well, but Um, So my life is very much music at the moment. So when I have these friends who are in different worlds, it's very uh, refreshing when I kind of go and hang out with them because I'm not like hung up on like a certain band or like if something's not going well in my musical world, like I can kind of like take a step back and I kind of almost felt like I I have a breather or I can just talk about them about something else completely. Um, It's kind of I think it's really important to have that balance. Absolutely. And then realize like, ultimately it's like, oh, wow. Like, you know, especially from your perspective of your friends being involved in like literal life-saving work, you're just like, oh yeah, like we're talking about music stuff. This is not important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally. Like it's so funny. Cause sometimes I come off tour and I, I'll go, um, I'll go for dinner with my friend Nish and like, I sometimes go, oh, like I'm about to say I'm so tired. And she would literally just come off night shifts from like working as a doctor in the hospital. And I have to stop myself going, nope. I'm not going to say that she knows, but she's not like, she's not bad about it. She won't be like, you don't know what it's like to feel tired. She's very um, humble about it. But yeah, you're just like, you literally probably like, you know, saved lives. And I've just been entertaining people. Right. <laughs> I've just been yelling into a microphone, driving around the country. And yeah. like, what, what, what have I done? <laughs> you've done, yeah, the, exactly. you've done the real work. <laughs> the, yeah, um, sure. And so then, uh, like you said, as you were kind of, you know, uh, getting pulled into the the music direction and, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of li- listing those bands because I do think, um, you know, I mean, the, like clearly that, uh, you know, whole genre, you know, new metal, like had so many different phases over here in America and captured so many people's attentions. Um, and I think now it's viewed on with, uh, you know, kind of reverence, like, you know, cause I mean, at one point, obviously like a band like Limp Bizkit was a punchline. Everyone was just like, Oh dude, no one admits they like Limp Bizkit. Like that's not cool. You know, whereas now people are just like, Oh yeah, $3 bills, like a, you know, unbelievable record. And it's like, you know, for a couple of years, people were just like, you don't say anything like that, you know, <laughs> like just, yeah, because. it almost became a, like new metal almost became a swear word, didn't it? And I, I love new metal. And like, I just think because like, especially when someone's like my age as well, like, um and older it's because it was just such a it was such a pivotal moment for me getting into music is like getting caught on Limp Biscuit, uh Papa Roach, Corn and like because it had that sort of like the the sort of like the singing as well as the screaming because when when you first get into it it's almost sort of like you need to develop your palette for it because if you go from 
listening to like red hot chili peppers like i did straight into slipknot it's just not going to work so you almost sort of need these kind of like in between bands like nirvana um like like especially like limp biscuit and lincoln park as well because i was um big into rap and hip-hop and still am um but like in my school like uh eminem was massive and it's like obviously jay-z as well like as like they are globally um so when lincoln park did that uh reanimation record um i was just hooked and then i obviously checked out their stuff um through that record um and yeah literally just delved into the world like that no it's a very good point because i think that's you know people need to have gateway bands, you know, whether it's like their first time getting into music or like to your point, whether it's transitioning them into something, um, you know, harder or softer or whatever it is like, you know, because (laughs) especially too, where it's like, you know, say say you start to go down the, you know, aggressive road and get really into, you know, everything aggressive from metal and hardcore and punk and stuff like that. And then at some point, then you realize like, Oh yeah. Like I like singing too. So like I can listen to indie rock or like you have, you have to have all of these junctures as opposed to, you know, going from one thing that everybody listens to, to the most extreme version of it. Like it just, it's not sustainable. No, not at all. And like, I knew um, people growing up, like who, who were just like, no, I just listened to like death metal. Everything else is like, like pussy and like and then these people like fast forward to now like they're just like oh yeah i don't know what i was on about i actually really like deftones <laughs> totally yeah it, tr- especially too when you're younger it's like you make these really really hard stances against things that you know yeah. like out of principle it's like i don't like that and you're just like god white pony is such a good record what am i talking about <laughs> it's so profound <laughs> yeah it's um it's so funny it's just such a um yeah, it's just, it's just growing up, isn't it? You just like you want to identify with something so badly because you're this absolute, like I don't know, um, what's the word? You're just tragic, like just trying to find who you are when you're going through puberty. You're just an absolute emotional wreck, just trying to cling on to any little click or or like genre or any sort of interest at all. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a all or nothing approach. That's very, <laughs> yeah. it's like you're either all of this or you're none of that. And you cannot be any sort of uh, there, there. There can't be any nuance in your approach <laughs> you have to be the most extreme version of whatever it is you're getting into. Yeah, exactly. I've always, uh, I've always your opposer. I think that was the term. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Um, and so, you know, as you started to, like you said, you know, play guitar and get into this and, you know, going to your, uh, your local Y shows and everything like that. Um, you know, I, I presume at one point you were looking around and you were just like, Oh yeah, like uh, clearly there are not very many girls here, or there's just you know it's very dude centric. Um, you know, did that uh, like did that ever register to you, or did you even ever pay attention to that? You were just like, oh yeah, I recognize it, but you know, obviously it's not going to stop me from you know going to these shows or pursuing the music stuff. Um, so because I started off um, in sports, I I've almost I've always almost like been immune to like. Real, I don't know, just like I hadn't realized it um, for like a very long time, like when I started the band in a weird way, only like when people would sort of mention it, just because like when I first started playing sports um, in middle school, there weren't many girls teams. So sometimes they'd have to do um, mixed gender teams. So I was just kind of like I was kind of used to being a very male heavy environment. Um, so, yeah, like fast forward when we started doing like bands and stuff, it was just sort of almost like a another day in the office, as it were. Um, but yeah, like it's, it was like definitely, um, the, the like girls in bands were definitely scarce. Like when I first started the band, um, I don't know if you know a band called Royal Tomasi. Um, yes. yeah, yeah. Very good. But like when Eva started, when she was 14 back in 2005, I think there definitely wasn't girls in bands then, like, especially in this kind of heavy music. Um, like she tells me like horror stories of, about things like people have said to her and, and things like that. Like, I, I think it's such a, a massive step up fast forward to 2020 where it's just, um, well, I just think it's booming. I mean, there's so many bands like you had, um, you got punch, like who I sort of first started getting, like they were like the first death wish band, um, I got properly into, oh, nice. um, and then, uh, who else? And then Oathbreaker who from Belgium. So across the pond, mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you got like loads of bands like that. And like, obviously Venom Prison, which I mentioned before, who like sort of came in later on. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of them around for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I just, so it's, 
I mean, I know from the, you know, opposite side of the <laughs> gender spectrum of being like, you know, when I started to go to shows in the, the mid nineties and then just being like, oh yeah, like, you know, this is like 99.9% dudes. And it's like, anytime I saw a girl at a show, it was always like, what are you doing here? Like, this is so cool. Like, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, how did you know about this? To- to- get- <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm just like, uh, Oh, that like, that's cool. Cause like, I, I mean, honestly, my naive brain at a certain point was just like, I, I didn't even know that like, you know, girls could come to like aggressive music shows. And that's it. Of course, an extreme, <laughs> I, I didn't actually believe that, but it was just like, wow, that's cool. And then, you know, over time it started to become more pervasive where it was just like, Oh yeah. It's not just like, you know, the girlfriend of, you know, the singer of the band or whatever. It was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Broadly looking at the name, I was going, oh. oh, God, I just want to go out to dinner. <laughs> totally, totally. And I, I, I think my my view is also because I, uh, in high school, I dated a girl that was, like, super into ska. And so, like, we would go to each other's shows. Like, she would go to my hardcore shows and I'd go to her ska shows, um, which, in retrospect, was so painful for her. It was like, you know, watching, like, Vision of Disorder and Bloodlet, just being like, oh my gosh, like I want to kill myself versus me yeah, who's watching. Section. Yeah, on. Totally. That I, but then I'm watching, you know, whatever band, horrible bands like Bim Scala Bim or whatever and being like, oh yeah, this, this sucks, oh. but it's still fun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, it, it was, uh, it, it, I mean, it's cool that, like you said, your perspective was, was uh, already sort of colored by the fact that you were just like, well, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm just pursuing this because I like it as opposed to like, you know, me feeling outnumbered or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And like, you know, when I, I was younger as well, like I just used to look up to football players like David Beckham, Michael Owen, uh, Alan Shearer, and like people like that. Cause like even like women's football at the time wasn't, um, wasn't a thing. Well, it was a thing, but like definitely a more underground. Right, sure. right, right, right. And so, so I was sort of like used to looking at like Corey Taylor and, right. And like, uh, you know, try like Randy Blythe from like Lamb of God. I was just like, oh yeah, they're sick vocalists. So I, I want to try and be like them. Right, right. And did you uh, did you care about school? Like, did you have kind of a vision of what you wanted to be when you grow up? When you grew up? Um, no, actually, like I literally, um, I don't even know. So I when I when I was younger, I actually really wanted to be um, a paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> that is good and then, uh, did you watch jurassic yeah, park and then like get oh, into it yeah i was okay big into that like, yeah for sure like as you can tell i was a huge huge tomboy but um <laughs> yeah we have this really sick uh natural history museum uh in in london and like we have like one of the the best dinosaur collections um i, I still go there fondly every now and then um but yeah i used to like go there most weekends my uh my aunts and uncles would take me but um yeah anyway so yeah i went from dinosaurs to to media studies. <laughs> That's funny. Um, one, yeah. <laughs> one transition into another. Maybe it's because I really like Jurassic Park. And I'm like, well, if I don't get to meet the dinosaurs, maybe I could film them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. A loose yeah. connection. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe I could do that. Um, so did you, uh, I guess, did you pursue, uh, you know, college, university um, after you graduated to secondary school? Yeah, so I, I did, um, what did I do? I did filming uh, in college. And then in university, I studied 3D animation because for a while I wanted to get into special effects. Oh, okay. um, but then I quickly realized that I was by far the chattiest person on my course. And then when I went to um, like one of the sort of work experience days, they went to the moving picture company which does like loads of like really sick um, things. I think they did Inception and stuff like that. Uh, they like showed us around and one of the floors, which would be like the thing that I was specializing in was literally uh, they had pulled all the curtains cause they, they were in with the color graders. So I literally walked into this office of almost silence and like just tapping and like dark room. And I was just like, I can't, I can't be in this environment. I think people get pissed off with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a ama- that's amazing that you <laughs> that you were like you saw your future and you were like i can't be in this room like <laughs> no i can't because like I, I think like i got on really well with everyone in my course and stuff but i was by far the sort of like the class clown and just sort of like they were very like computer orientated people and god animation like i mean hats off to them 
you're literally like working hours um just to do five seconds and it's soul destroying like it's so hurtful when you just kind of go oh i've done for the day press play and you're like oh i've done like literally five seconds yeah (laughs) totally yeah i i have put you know so many man hours into making this uh you know character's arm move a millimeter or whatever yeah and it still looks weightless and useless. So you're just sort of like, that doesn't even look real. I've just like, and you kind of want to have a little mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I guess, if, right. You have to look at, uh, uh, you have to have, be a personality that, uh, you know, relishes in the small victories where it's like, you can't look at the big picture because then, yeah, you, your soul will be destroyed. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, my lecturer, bless him, like he he totally sort of cottoned on to this. And he was like, you know, oh, well, you know, maybe you could be like a, a producer or something. You like you like people <laughs> like just try to sort of like, you know, you can you can do something else. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can. Right. You, the, the road that you were building for yourself, uh, you ran into a wall. But yeah, you could probably do these other things. Yeah, why not? You know, you can tap chat to people. You like doing that. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, that's funny. Were your, um, I mean, like you said, your parents were, uh, supportive over you getting into, you know, kind of weirdo music, but was there ever a point where they were, you know, like, I I don't, uh, I don't understand this at all. And, um, it's cool that she's exploring this, but you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of nervous for her as well. Yeah. I think like when I, so, um, they were stoked that I got a degree, um, because I think apart from my aunt, um we're like the only ones in the family with a degree and it was like a real real thing because like I was I fared quite well uh in uh academic things so they were just like oh go to university go get a degree so I got that so once like that sort of satisfied them for a bit and then uh I worked at this sort of like apple reseller kind of franchise thing and I did that for a couple years and they're like oh you know so like you know are you uh are you gonna are you gonna get a job in animation or what, what are you gonna do for like a career kind of thing um, but then fortunately I started interning at Holy Raw, uh, Holy Raw Records, which I work at now. Um, and then like from there, because I, I interned there one day a week and I worked at the, uh, sort of <laughs> fake Apple store, um, for like the, the rest of the week, I kind of like managed to sort of transition into full time at Holy Raw. So like ever since then, like I've kind of like made a career out of it. Um, so like now they're kind of, uh, they're uh, happy for my future, I think. Right, it's just sure. a classic parent thing, isn't it? Just wanting wanting your kid to support themselves, I think. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, the the fear comes in. It's not so much of the, that they don't understand it because, you know, most generate, you know, the generational divide between parents and their, their kids is, you know, obvious. But ultimately, it's just like the, are you going to be okay? Like what, I mean, working on a record label, is that going to be okay? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. okay. Yeah, totally. It's fine. <laughs> You know, they're, they're... Oh, yeah, it's totally different for sure. Yeah, because like uh, going back to my dad, like he he's from North Wales um, and like his like only options for employment were sort of like mainly the army, basically. So he just sort of went for that. So like the idea that I can sort of potter about talking to bands and stuff for a living is uh, is much better than going to the army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a much more uh, con- convenient lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, I hear it's safer as well. So um, that's right. always good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. As long as you don't uh, cross cross a band and, uh, you know, not pay them royalties and then they, uh, you know, they, they send a uh, mafia member to come put a hit on you or something. But that was in yeah. the 80s. So I think yeah, I think sure. we're past that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think like heroin's not a good career move as well. And true, you know, I think if you stay away from that kind of stuff, I think you're pretty golden. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, and so then you, when you were you know starting to play guitar and and going to shows and everything like that, was it always like did it occur to you pretty early that you wanted to play in a band, or was that something that kind of developed a little bit later? Um, so I uh, literally since like I got into that kind of music, uh, I wanted to play in a band, but I was so sort of hyperactive and impatient that I kind of like, I didn't sort of take the time to get really good at guitar. You know, when you hear like about really good guitarists, like being antisocial, sitting in their rooms, like playing guitar for a whole summer, that just, that wasn't me. Like I was sort of bouncing off the walls, like going outside and like hanging out with friends and stuff all the time. So um, it wasn't until I was like 18 or 19 um that my boyfriend at the time he's like now my husband uh was just like oh hey like you know why didn't you start doing vocals um and then uh yeah it started started from there really 
Nice, nice. That's <laughs> I do like uh, you painting that picture of just being like, uh, yeah, I wasn't spending hours in my room playing guitar. Like I was playing 10 minutes at the most and then I had to go on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, literally like a fly. I was, uh, yeah, my attention spans really bad it's something i've had to really work on in adult life maybe i have the undiagnosed adhd probably right. yeah so maybe maybe some medication could help that yeah <laughs> um and was it always the you know i guess how did you um you know fall into the the have you always done vocals for all the bands that you've played in or was it a mixture of you sampling around a bunch of stuff yeah so like um at the very beginning i had like a little electronic project and i was like 14 15 and I did like Fruit Loops kind of stuff. Um, so like I did a bit of that. And then um, I sort of stopped from then on. I kind of just did, um, what did I do? Yeah, I just did vocals uh, from then on, really. Yeah, and like Employed Serves, like my first band. Um, so yeah, that's it's still my only band. I know, that's uh, that, and that's really weird. That's not common. I hope you understand that. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm still that way, yeah, I think I've learned like through my friends, like all the things to not do, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think because usually you, you know, you, you play in like terrible local bands and, you know, you're awful for, you know, whatever, a couple of years. And then, you know, you play in something that's a little bit more professional that, you know, you can feel comfortable putting out records or whatever. So, yeah, you're lucky. That's good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and like uh, before that, I sort of did a lot of music photography. I was really big into that. So I was quite close to a lot of bands like I kind of like heard sort of like murmurings of what, what was going wrong in their band and things. And I, was, I think I took mental note, fortunately. Right, right. No, that's good. That's good. At Manasquan Bank, we believe in putting our clients first. That means offering competitive rates, convenient digital banking options, and exceptional service. Our team of friendly and knowledgeable bankers are here to help you every step of the way. Whether you're opening a new account or planning for retirement, ready to experience the Manasquan Bank difference for yourself? Visit us online at manasquan.bank or any of our branch locations throughout New Jersey. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Leftovers or the DMV or house cleaning or Chumba Casino always brings the fun. Play over a hundred different games online for free from anywhere. You could redeem some serious prizes. Chumba. ChumbaCasino.com. Live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. T plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Why is La Isla Bonita one of her most famous songs? So when you're wrong, are you often long with <laughs> like this? Because you should really like slow it yes. down, listen, okay. and then get to the right yes, Okay, is. That's okay. what this whole okay, podcast okay. is. It's just Fran being wrong at length. Rose. Fran, how did we make it to the second season of our podcast and we still have all these opinions? Uh, pardon my non-binary vibe, but I'm just like, <laughs> does it all need to be explained? Pat took the glasses off her face, put them on America, <gasps> and those are Betty's glasses. That's so shit. Yeah! <laughs> A forgotten Madonna album. Forgotten by the world, maybe, but not by and me. Not, and not by me. Hope is a dangerous thing for a woman like me to have, but I have it. But I have it. <laughs> but I have it. Period. Father, son, house of Gucci. Like a Virgin is proud to be a part of the Outspoken Network from iHeart Podcasts. Listen on the iHeart Radio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and so, you know, as you started to get out there with, you know, employee to serve and people started paying attention to it and, you know, you started to play shows and everything like that. Um, you know, when did it, I guess, f feel, uh, you know, quote unquote real to you where it's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I mean, clearly you're, you've worked with Holy War Records, like not only as your job, but, you know, you've worked with them putting out your records and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be as, as something as, you know, huge as like, oh, yeah, I remember when we played our first, you know, sold out show in front of 400 people or whatever. But like, you know, when did it feel like there was, uh, I guess, momentum, for lack of a better term? I think when we did our second album, the Warmth of Dying Suns, like release show, it was in this uh, 150 cap venue called the Old Blue Last. And I just remember being like so anxious before the show, like going, oh, my God, like, what if no one turns up? Like, this is going to be really embarrassing. And like genuinely getting, you know, when you throw a party and you're scared no one's going to come. Like I was getting like really like that. And then I, um, because I was like upstairs, like because I was quite nervous as well. 
Um, and I went downstairs to the venue just as like the first band started playing. I literally couldn't get in the room. And I was like, oh, like, you know, it's, it's like over capacity. And I was like, oh, this is this is wow. Wow, this is crazy. And then in my, in my head, I was still like, oh, maybe it's just because, you know, all the other bands are here. They might like leave after and not watch us. And then, yeah, like it was. Yeah, it was one of the most mad shows. Like it's even like after like playing like the Roundhouse of Barry Tomorrow in December and stuff, which was like all amazing. But it's when you do your first like proper headline show and it's like that, that's when you like really feel like, oh, like people people really care. Yeah, totally. Like people are here and they are participating in what it is that we are putting out there. Yeah, for sure. And you're like, oh, people actually like know this. They're not you know, they're not just here by accident. They're not sort of like held against their will. They actually like paid to come here. Right. Yeah. It's not just like a Saturday night activity. It's like, no, there's, you know, people are committed to this thing. They've, they've paid <laughs> yeah. money to this thing. This is, this is wow. Yeah. I get it. No. And I, I appreciate that, uh, snapshot. Cause I do think that it's easy to, um, you know, especially like at, once you kind of get on the treadmill of, you know, putting out records and being, you know, the, uh, you know, in the music business as it were, when you actually stop and be like, Oh wow. Like these people have, you know, taken the time out of their day. They've taken their hard earned money and they're investing it towards this particular band or music project. That's what it's like. Oh yes. That's important. Yeah, for sure. Especially when you kind of think loads of people complain about their jobs. So not only are they spending their money, but they spend hours like doing something they hated to earn it, to spend on you. So it's a, it's a real privilege. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, And when you started to get out there and, you know, tour, I know touring in the UK is clearly much different than touring in Europe and, you know, touring in the States, um, you know, which clearly you've done. I mean, you got you have not come to the States. Am I crazy about that or no? No, you're correct. Um, But we are coming this summer um, and we're announcing it soon. Okay, great. Uh, Very, very, very excited about it. We've literally had our visa forms filled in for four years because we've had a couple of things like sure. come up and fall through. We've been hurt many times. So I uh, hope yeah, this should, it should happen for sure. Got it. Got it. So when you started to get out there and tour, um, did you immediately like it? Did you have to grow to like it? Where, where did you end up on the spectrum? Uh, I loved it. Like, so I started touring when I was 21. Yeah. Like 21. So like I was still in like party mode and I was just like, Oh yeah. We're like, <laughs> Like free beer all the time right? Ooh, yeah like i was just like I, I hit i hit the and then like a couple like days and i realized you can't drink loads every day and be okay and then uh <laughs> and then i kind of like mellowed out and i was like yeah this is still sick um yeah i i, I literally love it like even um fast forward six years i'm just like this is still my favorite part of being in a band i just really like the the sort of camaraderie you get on tour like with other bands and I have like so many great friendships formed by touring or through this band that, it, you know, like, um, so like we, uh, I got married to the, the guitarist of our bands, uh, Sammy, like on New Year's Eve this year. Um, and like all, like almost all my wedding party was like people from music or people I'd like met through the band or Holy Raw. And I was like, this is, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, I love touring basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And I mean, it, it clearly it suits your personality of y- you not being in a darkened room making, you know, an arm move uh, a millimeter. It's like, yeah, you you want to be a uh, person amongst the people. Yes. Yeah, I definitely, definitely do. I have to watch myself sometimes because I don't want to be that first, like on the first day of tour, that person that comes up to go, oh, hello, I'm Justine. And they're like, oh, God, go away. I'm still tired. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I was, a, I was actually going to bring that up because I, I think that you, uh, you know, Pete, I mean, I, we, we have mutual friends, but no one has ever said this about me. So this is me, uh, uh casting a, uh, uh, a description of you that, uh, you know, is probably not applicable, but might have been echoed in some capacity that, you know, uh, people such as yourself who are, you know, enthusiastic and passionate can sometimes be viewed as a punisher where you're just like, you know, Oh my gosh, like I, I'm so excited to talk to you. And people are just <laughs> yeah. like, can you calm down? Um, have pe- have people um i guess said that about you or are you uh, aware of that or is that something that you try to um like you said are, are conscious about not being that overwhelming person i think like working in retail for so many years and like just sort of just being in social situations and being punished myself like so many times i've i like to think i've kind of built this self awareness so i sort of like i pick and choose my moments so i kind of like I'll go up to sort of like the buffet table and be like, hey, man, 
and then but inside I'll be like wanting to talk to them and then eventually I'll say more words <laughs> right you're like I gotta slow roll this I can't yeah <laughs> right I can't be I can't be the, the person that uh sucks the air out of the room and is like you know <laughs> trying to meet all 20 band members in one day yeah I've got to bottleneck my personality for a little bit and then uh and then I'm all good <laughs> well that, I mean that's good because I I do think that that's part of growing up and being aware of yourself because you know whatever when you were probably 15 or 16 years old yeah you were you know probably the bull in the china shop and being like hey everybody (laughs) yeah it's like in theory like everyone likes watching spongebob but if they knew a spongebob in their life it would be very annoying (laughs) so you don't want to be a spongebob i literally have never thought about it in those terms but that just broke my brain you're so you're so right you're so right maybe you need to be a bit of squidward and a bit of spongebob and you're golden yeah that's true <laughs> i never yeah maybe just another word for punisher is just yeah just just don't be a spongebob <laughs> yeah like no one gets that excited over flipping burgers no one does. why i love that i love that um and working, uh, like you said, you know, working at Holy Roar and, you know, writing for Kerrang and stuff like that and being able to, to you know, kind of transition your passions into being able to, um, you know, create a living for yourself. Uh, you know, a lot of people, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like I, I worked for, you know, Century Media for about like 10 years or so. And the, the feedback that I got from so many people as I started to kind of work at a record label was like twofold. One, you have to be careful that your personal tastes don't trump any sort of, uh, you know, business endeavors, like, you know, what you like, maybe not is the best thing to sign. Like, you know, (laughs) there's, there's been times where a person's like, oh yeah, you don't have to sign that band. You can just buy their next record. And it's like, oh yeah, you're right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, has, has that like, have you noticed that in yourself as well? Like, or is that pieces of advice that people have, you know, kind of offered up in, in a similar fashion? Do you know what? I'm, I'm genuinely like, this isn't a lie, but I genuinely love every band that's on Heidi Raw um like as because we are a smaller label than someone like century media i think that gives us the freedom to solely work with bands that we like because there's no no bands where we're like oh we're not like 100 percent on them but we know they'll sell records like there's there's none of that in holy raw um so i'm in this like really sweet spot where i know like if i went to like a you know if we got like really big or if i went to a bigger label or whatever i know that would change um so like yeah like i can totally see that being a thing like i I guess it's something we might have to uh look into as we grow as a label because obviously at the end of the day you gotta pay your bills um but yeah like it must be like must be really hard it's kind of like that as well when you like pick touring buddies you're kind of like oh they don't sell any tickets but i really like them right they're a band's (laughs) band right yeah exactly you're just like oh they're my they're my like my bros and stuff and you know but they'll literally bring like their girlfriends or boyfriends and that's it um so yeah yeah, like i I guess like for sure like it must be so hard um especially for like major labels as well um like having to sort of like separate that because you'd be like oh this band like i mean they might sell like 10 percent of the pressing but they're really cool right and it's like well yeah (laughs) And you, and you do, I mean, like once you start to talk about, you know, business implications and, and all of these other things that, you know, at at the end of the day, you understand why they exist and why these labels have to make the decisions that they do. Um, you know, but being able to weigh the pros and cons of like, oh yes, like I will just remain a fan of this band. And I realize that I can't, you know, I can't strike up a a business conversation with them or whatever, because, you know, negative four people are going to buy the record or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Just you will buy the record. Precisely. But you work for free because you work for them. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, totally. It's like, yeah, I don't need to, I don't need to put out this record in order to sync the label and lose people's jobs just because I want to buy it. Like (laughs) they'll, they'll probably figure (laughs) out another way to put it out or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, and then another, the kind of the, the second thing that, you know, people always echoed at me was the, you know, like blending the sort of, you know, passion and, and business, uh, it can sometimes be, um, you know, you work so hard because you care so much about it, but being able to kind of, uh, separate the two things to where it's like, well, like, you know, at at the end of the day, this is a job and yes, you're working with something you're passionate about, but, you know, being able to kind of separate those two. And I mean, I guess that goes back to an earlier point of what you were saying, having friends outside of the music industry can kind of keep you, you know, balanced. But is that a, is that a thought process that you kind of have to, you know, keep in your mind or is that something you're not concerned about? 
oh like 100 percent, it's just a thing i have to like consciously uh check in with like so like the whole like one of the, a, a big reason why uh i decided to get employed to serve scientists spine farm was because like i found it very difficult um muddying the waters between holy raw and employed to serve so that my job and my sort of passion project and it was becoming quite difficult to sort of like compartmentalize them because i i didn't want to like um like spend too much time on my own band so what i'd do is i'd overcompensate by ignoring my own band sometimes uh and i was like yeah this isn't good so like i in the end we sort of like um parted ways but obviously i, I still work for holy raw uh, and, and likewise in, in life as well, because I, I literally like I come home and I, I do music stuff with ETS or like I've got a few side projects that I'm starting up as well. And then I, I work with music you, like you just literally have to have um, sort of like other hobbies. Like at the moment I try to go running or I read books like just to sort of make sure I shut off from music because otherwise you just get burnt out. Like I kind of felt like that about two years ago after I come off a really long tour and I went straight back into working and I was just sort of like almost like I, I kind of lost my sort of uh, my energy for it. And I started like noticing it and I was like, oh, I can't let this happen. Like I have to sort of make sure that I take holidays or like I just shut off for a while. And that's not even like um, meaning like I stopped listening to music for a few days. It just means like I just don't go on Instagram for a bit or um, I don't talk about band stuff or work stuff like with anyone for like a few days. Um, but yeah, like I think it's. I think it's a uh, thing for everyone in, in all walks of life, really. Like any like sort of work thing that kind of dominates your sort of life. Um, you have to sort of like spend some time, um, you know, spreading out in other ways, really. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, they're, I mean, the proverbial work-life balance that, you know, most people chase. It's like you, even if it, you're working with something that you're passionate about, you need to be able to, like you said, step away from it and turn it off and be like, okay, like, <laughs> this has to be sustainable for the rest of my life in some capacity. Otherwise you'll just turn up a, you know, jaded 33 year old and being like, music is war the worst. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I enjoyed music. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it and it, it's funny too. Cause like I, I reflect on that with people who, I mean, I myself am, am still straight edge, but like there are other people who it's like, you know, the ones who shout the loudest about, you know, being straight edge from, you know, 16 to 23 or whatever are the ones who, you know, whatever, two or three years after they stop being straight edge are just like, oh, that was the worst. And it's just like, what? Like, you cannot be it anymore and not talk <laughs> crap. Like, you know, it's just that 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 juxtaposition where it's just like it's never made any sense to me why you just like do a complete 180 and you're like, oh, yeah, the music's the worst. Straight edge is the worst or whatever. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, that's cute. You still put X's on your hands. And it's just like, <laughs> come on, man, like you were as well. Totally. Yeah, it's so funny. But that's that's like totally um, a reflection of their personality. It's like there's so many people in, like you meet through life who are all or nothing. Like, I know this, like, one guy who, like, you know, the classic, like, oh, I'm a carnivore. Now I'm a vegan. Now I'm a Christian. <laughs> and, like, I think he actually went Muslim as well at one point. And like, I'm just like, I, I don't know where you're at. Like, I mean, like, power to you. You're obviously finding lots of different things to get into. But you're literally just sort of, like, watching him like a ping pong ball go from different things to another. Um, I think, like, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because, like, you know, some people just don't grow out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And especially too, when uh, it doesn't seem like there is a consistent through line from one transition to the other, you know, where it's like, it, it's going from one thing. It, it, it There's no, um, you know, <laughs> to, to our earlier point of like, it's not like you're going from, you know, uh, a pop band to, you know, Slipknot to death metal. It's like you go from, you know, a pop band to death metal. It's like, wait, there, there's no transition point. I don't understand how you're going from this to this. <laughs> yeah, you're just leapfrogging everything. Where's your process? <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not Christian, I'm Muslim. And it's just like, well, I mean, they're both religions, but like, you know, they're like pretty vastly different from one another. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like, it's so mad. Like, <laughs> totally, totally. It's quite interesting seeing them update their Facebook pages and stuff and be like oh I saw what you're into this week um, <laughs> yeah. it's just this weird thing you always want to grab them and be like do you know what man like it's okay to be into different things that don't fit into other th you know you can like pe you can cherry pick from different things if you want you don't have to identify as anything yeah right or or yeah or you can kind of sit somewhere in the the weird middle which is frankly where most people sit <laughs> yeah exactly right. a bit more you know, rounded yeah yeah exactly 
Um, the last thing I want to hit on was, was something that you, you mentioned earlier, um, where, you know, you got married to the guitarist in your band. Um, and you know, many people, uh, look at, uh, the structure of bands and the collaborative process and, you know, how much time you spend together and all of that and be like, okay. Cause you know, usually most bands, like once they become, you know, professional touring artists, um, you know, they come home and they kind of separate from one another and <laughs> they, they give each other space from that perspective. But, you know, clearly you've, uh, attached yourself pretty deeply, not to the only the, to the band, but, uh, your significant other. Um, I'm sure most people are just like, that's, uh, that's, that's wild. You're doing a lot of things together. Hopefully that'll, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, I mean, like clearly, uh, it's something that you, you've put a lot of thought into, um, both of you, um, you know, but is it, uh, is it something where you guys have, um, these kind of, you know, uh, your, I guess your own spaces to exist to be like, oh yes, like, you know, we do have, you know, we're not completely attached to the hip 24 seven. Oh yeah. hundred percent. So like Sammy and I started dating when we were 16 years old. Um, so like we sort of, we basically kind of grew up together um like in a relationship so before we started employed to serve we'd been going out for like five years or something like that so we were sort of very comfortable with each other and sort of like had like so you know like when people first start dating they're attached to the hip and then then like a few years on they sort of coexist kind of thing uh so we'd already sort of got to that stage in our relationship well before then um and then uh and then, yeah, like, and, and as people, like, we're very, I don't know, we're just, we're just not very argumentative and, like, we're quite chill people. And we also, we kind of go off and do our own things quite often. Like, I'll go read or, like, and he'll do something else. Like, so we're very, like, good at sort of separating ourselves when needed. And, and like, when it comes to band stuff and, like, if anything comes, like, goes badly with a band, we sort of, like, have, a, like, a little rule where if, like, you know, we spend more than 20 minutes, like, getting annoyed and discussing it and stuff like we just sort of like leave it and just like do something else um you know and like yeah just sort of like normal things it's almost like what other couples do you just have like date nights and things like that you kind of like compartmentalize things because there's so many couples who like you know run businesses together and and work together it's kind of almost like a similar thing really Sure. Yeah. yeah that's the same. And to your point too, because you guys have built the foundation of a relationship, uh, you know, separate from the band, uh, you guys know each other, you know, deeply beyond just being like, oh yeah, we met through this band. And you know, <laughs> that's kind of like our identity that's wrapped up into it. Like your relationship exists beyond that, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. And he's got like other bands that I'm not in. Um, and like, yeah, we just like have like different friendship groups as well. And it's a it's a healthy mix, I think. And like also I, well, I, like another thing as well, like all bands have like a, a mum and dad figure and ours is just a bit more traditional. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're literally, yeah, literally the mother and the father of it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, That's it kind of works well. Right. Um, I, I actually thought of one more thing uh, to ask you before I let you go was the, uh, you know, just because you have uh, been involved in so much of the business side of things and the music business. And yes, you are at, you know, working at a label, like you said, where, you know, you like all the bands and, you know, all of these uh, things are coexisting um, amongst each other. Well, now, especially with the separation of, you know, Holy Roar and employed to serve where, you know, you're someone else is actually able to help you with the band. Um, but do you, you obviously enjoy the, business of music um so it, was that something that you had to um i guess grow accustomed to or did you immediately kind of take to it and enjoy that aspect of it uh i think i took to it quite um quite quickly so like I, i'm quite uh an anxious person as well so like the the idea of like knowing what's going on and having plans and stuff like really suits me well um, so I think I naturally sort of gravitate to sort of like organizational things and, you know, taxes and making sure I don't get in trouble and just like all these kind of things that like I get worried about. I'm very like I like to do stuff about them so I don't have to worry about them. So, yeah, like I literally just sort of like as soon as the band started, I sort of like made sure I knew about like release plans, like I knew like what time we we're leaving and, and just things like that. So it was one of those things I kind of I sort of uh melded into very quickly got it got it and then you um i mean doing the, the label side of things uh you feeling like you couldn't really um you know work on your band because you feel like people would be like well of course justine like you know of course you know employee to service yeah. gonna get this cool thing um did you <laughs> 
I guess, did you recognize it in yourself or was it something that someone kind of like jokingly brought up to you and then you started to realize that? Uh, I think it was a, a bit of both. So like, cause, um, Alex and I, the, uh, so Alex is the label owner of Holy Raw. Like, yeah, we have like, we do things properly. We have like staff appraisals and stuff like that. So we like, we sort of like touch base and we like discuss things like this. And we sort of both agreed that it would look bad if, um, like I, I posted about employed to serve too often on the Instagram or, or things like that. So, um, yeah, it was sort of like a, you know, a general thing really. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than, you know, the bands and the label being like, uh, hey, Justine, um, you, you're only promoting your own band. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a weird thing. Hey, you could uh, give us a win sometime. It's like in uh, Talladega Nights. I don't know if you watched it. Absolutely. Yeah. He's just sort of like, hey, Ricky, maybe you could let me win one day. And like, he's like, no, like, but then I won't win. <laughs> right. Yeah. But no, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're always second, dude. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jesse. This was really fun. I appreciate you spending time with me. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, as I said, I really enjoy your podcast. This is sick. That is what is up. So thank you very much, Justine, for coming on the show. I always, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I mean, we're whatever. We're like almost 400 episodes into this thing. And uh, it just always makes me happy when people agree to be on the podcast. Like, I know maybe it should be some sort of routine now at this point, but uh, I'm just, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have these discussions and share them with you. So thank you, Justine. And uh, next week, we got Sam. I'm totally going to butcher his last name. Xiamorento? I think so. But Sam is from Drain. He's the vocalist of an amazing hardcore band out of the Northern California slash Santa Cruz area. Just released their debut LP on Revelation Records. And I love the band so much. I saw them at Sound and Fury for the first time last year and fell in love with them and just love what they do. So I wanted to have Sam on, and that's exactly what happened. So that's what we got next week. Look forward to it. And until then, like I always say, but I mean it oh so much more now than ever, please be safe, everybody. Leftovers or the DMV or house cleaning or chumba casino always brings the fun play over a hundred different games online for free from anywhere you could redeem some serious prizes chumbacasino.com live the chumba life no purchase necessary we're prohibited by law plus terms and conditions apply see website for details hey everybody i'm coach bill courtney from the oscar-winning documentary undefeated I believe that our country's problems can never be solved by a bunch of fancy people in nice suits talking big words that nobody ever uses on CNN and Fox, but rather by an army of normal folks, us, just you and me saying, hey man, I I can help. Our podcast, An Army of Normal Folks, is building up this army that I think can change this country, and I hope you'll join us wherever you listen to podcasts.